welcome to the Born Free podcast, where we'll discuss the challenges facing the world's wildlife and ecosystems. My name's Sarah Locke and I'll be talking to the passionate people doing their bit to try and secure a future where wildlife and humans can peacefully coexist. So today we're joined by Greta Iori. Welcome, Greta. Thank you. Um, So you are a consultant for conservation, sustainable development, international wildlife crime. That is such a broad title um, and really interesting. So can, can you tell us what kind of things do you get up to? And I mean, who do you work with? So yes, indeed, it is quite a broad title. My consultancy roles kind of goes into many different spheres when it comes to wildlife conservation. I'm currently working with two um, organizations predominantly, the Elephant Protection Initiative and Wildlife Conservation Society. Both of the roles are kind of based out of the Horn of Africa, Mm -hmm. with WCS working in Ethiopia and the EPI working in the Greater Horn. I work with everything from local community community engagement, ivory management, ending the illegal wildlife trade, and yeah, all of the campaigning that, that, that needs. Amazing. So how did you get into that? So this is an interesting story because a Mm -hmm. lot of people ask me, how do you become a consultant in such a niche world? Well, I studied natural resource management. And when I finished my studies, it was at the height of the rhino horn trade. And I, I studied something that was not being looked into, which was the issues that come and stem from um, militarizing anti-poaching units. And at the end of that study, what I found was that, in fact, militarizing those anti-poaching units was was maybe perpetrating the the crimes. Oh, wow. Yeah, so because nothing had actually been looked at from that angle, we always look at the wildlife crime issue first from the perspective of the criminals rather than the communities that might be affecting. Um, that allowed me to get into consulting because the UNDP and the big organizations that were looking at that trade wanted to see this new perspective that I was researching. Amazing. So was that a master's or for your undergraduate degree was that? Yeah. So that was my postgraduate uh, study, my master's. Amazing. And you're half Ethiopian. Yeah. And what was growing up? Did you grow up in Ethiopia? Yes, yeah. I did. And I- that must have been such an inspiration for you in terms of like getting into wildlife and natural resource management. Yes, definitely. My upbringing, my childhood growing up in Ethiopia in the wild and my parents were very, very, f- I mean, they held it really close to them that we understood the the issues that were being faced by the country with regards to environmental destruction. So that obviously shaped my passion for the subject. Do you ever have like a specific moment that sort of like really made you want to pursue it as a career or was it kind of like a growing thing? I think it's definitely something that grows on to you. You don't really think you can study wildlife crime or wildlife conservation or environment until you're a bit older. But I think there was a defining moment when my parents took us to the lower Omo of Ethiopia and we were on a trip with just my parents and my brother and I realized how passionate I was about just being out in the wilderness and I I still hold that very dear when I want to give up or when I want to change my career I'm like no you know that's where you're happiest. Yeah and that that's kind of keeps you going. Absolutely. That's really lovely. Yeah. Um, So would you say because I know that you work as you just said very closely with the Elephant Protection Initiative. Mm. Um, So would you say that you're more kind of driven to protect species or to kind of conserve um, the wider natural landscapes yeah so the elephant protection initiative i always say is more of a keystone name so the elephant is considered a keystone species because at the top of the ecosystem chain and therefore anything that falls underneath that is being protected when you protect and conserve elephant habitats and elephant ranges. So for me, it's definitely a wider scope. Um, The Elephant Protection Initiative works with communities, works with governments, works with ending the trade, so the criminal networks that are perpetrating the crimes. And in general, you have to look at all the angles to make a difference. You can't really work in a singular way, I think. And that's on Ethiopia and the Eritrea border, is that right? So all over the country. Oh, okay. So the, the way the EPI works is that there are member states. It's an African-led initiative, mm-hmm. and there's about 20 member states. And the EPI supports those governments in trying to implement their national elephant action plans. So in Ethiopia, I do pretty much anything and everything to do with elephants um, and all the ranges that they're found in. So community engagement, human wildlife conflict, and natural engagement of the people in the societies. And then in Eritrea, which is our latest mm-hmm. member, we're just starting to understand where we're going to start focusing on predominantly on ivory management to start and then possibly on, on, in the elephant range itself. So do you want to talk a little bit about Eritrea then? Because I know that previously they've had a closed government. So yeah. how do you kind of take steps forward with that? Yeah. Do they come to you and they say, we'd like to get, engage with you on X topic or how, how does that work? So Eritrea is an interesting one because 
my father was actually born in Eritrea, although he's Italian. Um, so oh, wow. it was a very special place for me to go once the border opened, once the peace deal was agreed in 2018. And as soon as that happened, I knew that I wanted to go and understand a bit better about their wildlife conservation because I had heard and known of an elephant population that is migra migratory between the two countries, Ethiopia and Eritrea. Um, so I went as just a civilian, as Greta, and not as an EPI or WCS, uh, not wearing those mm -hmm. hats, just to understand if it was ever possible to start working in conservation in the country. And I was received really well, in fact. And so to my surprise, they were very engaged and willing to discuss this. Um, and then when I started to better understand how the government works, which is still something that I am learning, it's a learning progress. Yeah, of course. Yes, it's been many, many years since they haven't engaged with international organizations um, but engaging with the right people on a human level has allowed us to make progress in the country and f for them to sign on to be the EPI, part of the EPI is a huge huge achievement for us I think. Amazing so what are the key threats and issues that kind of face that northerly population then and how do they differ I guess to the elephants that we actually probably hear more of in mm. you know sub-Saharan Africa, South Africa, yeah. you know Botswana etc. So the elephants like all elephant um, populations in Africa are threatened by poaching and human elephant conflict I think that's really big for them as well but what's interesting about that population it's one of the most northerly populations on the continent so we're very worried about the genetic health of that population considering that in the past they would have probably migrated to other areas and you know mixed them and meddled with other elephants but at the moment there's so much settlement and so much kind of corridors being blocked by human settlements that they wouldn't be currently migrating to those spaces and they're not engaging with other elephants. So over a long period, we're very worried that their genetic health will, will be impacted and obviously that would be the end of that genetic population. Um, so we're trying to understand if there's any way we can either create a transboundary conservation space um, and then hopefully one day bring in new, new males to really just encourage uh, healthier population. As in naturally, sorry. Do you mean yeah. that you, you would hope for that for those male elephants to come in naturally or you no, know, through for, translocation efforts yeah. once a space has been created? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. 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 And um, I read that uh, like since the 80s, Ethiopia has actually lost like up to 90% of its elephant population, which is obviously heartbreaking. But um, so are the elephants today, are they in, in national parks? Like are we talking about elephants in national parks or are they um, sort of found elsewhere? In Ethiopia, most of them are in national parks, but all of those parks except for one are really on the borders of the country. So they're either transboundary populations um, or very, very hard to see and very remote, which is why a lot of people don't even realize that Ethiopia's got elephants. It's not a destination where you say, I'm going to go out yeah, today and exactly. see elephants. Yeah, exactly. You never, you know, I've... I, it, for, you just, it's not one of those things that yeah. you think of. I think when you think of Ethiopia, people n like sort of automatically think of the Ethiopian wolf yeah. or lions even, Absolutely. or um, is it Galadas? The Galada. Yeah, Galada, yeah. sorry. Um, yeah, so I think those are the kind of things that people automatically think of, not really elephants, myself Absolutely. included. Yeah. Um, um, and how do you think we should, like, how do we go about kind of, creating this space where elephants can can thrive in Ethiopia? You know, it's interesting because Ethiopia used to have, obviously, a lot of elephants just 100 years ago. And that is, in fact, the reason why they are so few at the moment because it was one of the prime countries for ivory trafficking and trade legally at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and we provided a lot of ivory for all over the world. And now we've got none. And so how do we make that shift where we reintroduce populations or help protect them without putting them in danger? Because, in fact, I feel like the population at the moment is so critically endangered. There's less than 2,000 of them wow. that they're not... That in my opinion, there aren't enough of them to really thrive of them at the moment as a tourism product or anything. It's more the critical need is really just to protect them, make sure that they don't disappear. And in a, I guess, a landscape where conflict, um, drought, um, and I mean civil conflict, mm. has, you know, is... Uh, is an issue for the people you know is is such an issue for people how do we engage those people in in wildlife conservation how do you get those people on side and really try and value wildlife because that's such a difficult thing for Absolutely. us sat in the UK you know it's such a difficult thing to really put into context yes it, it is the greatest challenge of conservation and I always say that when we're dealing with conservation a lot of people focus on the illegal trade of animals but the biggest challenge is really human that the relationship between humans and wildlife and how we're going forward with that if people are not benefiting from them but they're 
in fact trying to survive in the same spaces and sharing the same habitats it's almost impossible to expect them to not come into conflict with them so my view is that you've got to always take a human heart to the critical issues that you're facing and try and put yourself in the position of those people how would you react and therefore that will allow you to find solutions um Two years ago, I developed Ethiopia's first community conservation strategy in an effort to try and do that, to try and kind of force organizations to have to include the voice of communities that are dealing with the the brunt of the biggest issue, you know, the problem. Yeah, I was going to come to this. So what are the kind of the key points of that? I guess you can't just sum it up just now. But yeah, what are the key kind of um, steps that you would take? It's more, it's really forcing organizations, NGOs, individuals to realize that as outsiders, and we will always be outsiders, Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. unless you're really living in those spaces with those communities to just include the voices of the leadership of those people and also the people that aren't part of the leadership you know then it will make you understand what the real issues are on the ground and then therefore hopefully you'll be able to have more inclusive solutions that work rather than coming from the UK and telling a government or a community how to live their lives you know yeah and I think you touched on something really interesting there um is kind of is how do you in a community how do you make sure that the kind of decisions that are being made are reaching those people that maybe aren't a leader of a community because mm. I think it's really easy for us as an NGO um, to go in um, and make decisions with a community leader but actually are, is that are yeah. those decisions how is that trickling down Absolutely. to the other people and what even is a community I always find that quite an interesting topic yeah. like is a community a is it a, a place is it you know a village or mm. is it you know a type of person that's doing one job I think mm. community is such a wide-ranging absolutely such a wide-ranging topic okay. yeah you're right um so I guess let's touch on on um trade then and poaching um mm. and am I right in thinking that a few years ago you came um into contact with poachers in Ethiopia mm-hmm. what can you tell us that story yeah so no I come into contact with poachers or traffickers on quite regular basis Mm -hmm. because I do a a lot of work with the trafficking department of Ethiopia of my country Um, so it is really challenging because a lot of times I find that poachers well there's meant a lot of research done that there's poachers are usually forced into it because of you know need subsistence and so on while traffickers are part of a larger organized criminal network but I find that regardless of the matter they're both um, kind of not at the top of the chain. So you could put them all behind bars, keep doing it for as long as you live and you still won't dismantle the illegal wildlife trade. So a lot of times I believe in the rule of law. So, you know, if you've been caught doing something that breaks the law, you need to pay the consequences. Mm -hmm. But I do also try and think of the bigger picture because at the end of the day, if the demand is still going, you can put all these guys behind bars and, and still have a million of them replacing them, you know? No, definitely. I think that's a really, really important topic. Um, And so how did you come into contact then with Born Free? Because I know that you're now on the board of um, Born Free Ethiopia. Yeah. Um, So how did you, yeah, how did you come into contact with us? So I've been obviously a fan of Born Free for a long time. I've loved the work that they've done all the way from the very first movie about Elsa. And I I initially contacted Born Free to try and fundraise for them in Babile, Elephant Sanctuary in Ethiopia, which is a project where they work. And I thought, you know, I want to give back, not just from doing my work, but actually fundraising for a project. And I thought that would be the best way to get into it. And then one thing led to another and I started partnering on projects and helping them manage their work. Amazing. And I know that one of your um, very early projects with Born Free was campaigning to close the lion park in Ethiopia. Yeah. And I know that that was in Addis, sorry. And I know that that was quite an infamous um, an infamous park. Do you want to tell us what, what the situation was there? Yes, absolutely. That park, I think anyone that's lived in Addis has either been there, known, known of it or, you know, visited or been against it. Um, and I always... Every time that I went, I always felt really sick to my stomach because it was it was a dire condition for an, a lion to be in. And then now it's closed down, but there is a new park um, in the prime minister's office, um, which I have seen as well and I've been consulted on. And although captive programs are not encouraged, um, we are tr- it's already been done and we are trying to see the that the best comes from this with regards to raising awareness and educational purposes for the okay. Ethiopian population. And so the lions from the Lion Park, what happened to those when after it was closed down? Have they gone to the President's yeah, Park? Is that exactly. right? So the ones that survived and remained alive during the, I think it was two or three per- year period where it was closed down, um, they've been relocated to the new PM's Park. And how do you think that we can best kind of empower people, I guess, to to recognize um, the value in wildlife, wildlife that's not behind um, captive enclosures? How do we do that, especially in somewhere maybe like Ethiopia, where it, 
those wild places aren't always that accessible. Absolutely. I think that's one of the most important things for me that really shifted my mentality about it. It's the reality is that for wildlife tourism, we're still very behind in Ethiopia and a majority of the Ethiopian population is not going to be able to go out and just see wildlife yeah. or it's out of their uh, capacity with regards to budget spending and so on. It's still quite expensive. So for me, it's really if there is captive programs, I, I hope that they teach the, the plight of that animal and, and really inspire young generations to pr want to protect them in the wild. And then, of course, directly linked to that is to make it affordable and hopefully develop tourism so that it's av available to the masses and not just the elite. No, absolutely, not just the few. Yeah. Um, and on that note, actually, you're also an advisor for Ethiopia's tourism organization, mm. wildlife crime and tourism, quite different things. Yeah. How did that come about? Well, actually, I think they're quite interlinked because there is, you know, Tourism destinations are hotspots for crime. Um, and just even in, in London, there's sometimes you'll see someone with a snake trying to take photos yeah. on the streets and so on. So the, the, the way that tourism works, it's really interesting where wildlife becomes a, a source of um, entertainment for the human population. I think it's really important. That's why I was really happy when both of the organizations asked me to advise them because I really do want this link to be in the at the very foundation of everything that we collaborate on. And what is the status of tourism in Ethiopia at the moment? I mean, you... you you might not have, you know, just figures off the top of your head, but I mean, I assume that, you know, sub-Saharan Africa, obviously wildlife tourism is booming. Yeah. Um, how exactly can Ethiopia, like, have a slice of that wealth, I guess? Yeah, so we definitely have a long way to go to compete with our neighbours in Kenya, yeah, Tanzania, course. South Africa, and so on. But we are really a different destination, at least to the world, we're known as the cultural historic destination. And I think we are doing a lot to try and promote that and change the visions, you know, of fear or poverty and that we have a lot to offer. But I'm hoping that the ecotourism angle of it can also be integrated into that. And there are parks that, you know, incredible parks like the Simeon Mountains. I was going to say, I'm yeah. desperate to go to the Simeon Absolutely. And the Bali. I think a lot of locals don't even know about the, the treasures that we are found within our country. We're a country with so many different landscapes. So I'm hoping that as the country stabilizes, as the country develops, that we're able to really integrate all the different forms of tourism that we can develop. Yeah. And how do you even, how do you, in your position, how do you even begin to kind of go about, um, I guess, uh, trying to persuade, you know, investors to, you know, seriously invest in, in wildlife tourism in Ethiopia? Or not even necessarily wildlife, you know, but as we just said, you know, yeah. tourism. Yeah, well, I think to me, it's, I mean, I'm obviously biased of being course. Ethiopia, but I think that we have something very unique. There's no other country on the continent like it. And the fact that we have such a rich history, we have so many different types of people, ethnically, traditions, cultures, and we also have one of the highest, um, um, what's it called like endemic um, oh, yeah, range endemics. of animals yeah, yeah, you know, we've got species, the most yeah. endemics so I think using what we, makes us different is actually going to put us in a better position yeah definitely and I think it's like we said talking about the elephants actually you don't even have to think of Ethiopia as yeah. an elephant destination there are so many other things absolutely you know the Ethiopian wolves there were only 500 left yeah um, I don't know what I what's the um gelada population like I'm not sure but it's it's a very healthy population yeah and I they, wouldn't be surprised. they're like primates aren't they yeah kind of they ought to me correct me if I'm wrong they kind of look like baboons is that right yeah yeah and they look like lions as well like yeah they're huge, huge aren't they yeah, how big beautiful. are they I mean, they're about a meter. Sizable. Yeah, yeah. But if you sit with them, they're about your height when you're sitting. Oh, and gosh. that's fascinating yeah, to amazing, me. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. Bet. Well, thank you so much. So just finally, um, so what do you hope that 2020 brings for Ethiopian wildlife? If you could pick two things, three things. What 20, I would hope that 2020 brings stability mm -hmm. and really more focus on helping the communities that live around these parks that are suffering the, the greatest challenges, trying to find solutions and integrate them, as well as getting them to benefit from the protection of these incredible species that we work with. And for yourself, I know that personally you got engaged this year, so I congratulations. I'm eyeing you. it up from afar. <laughs> Very nice. Thank you. Um, yeah, what, what do you hope? Are you, are you planning to get married this year? I am. Well, next year, 2020. Okay, next year. Oh, so, sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, I didn't mean that. <laughs> I'm getting Be married rapid. in 2020. So, yes, trying to balance ending the illegal wildlife trade and planning a wedding it's, no sure <laughs> you know Go hand in hand but yes it's gonna be interesting what's i don't know i'm really excited about 2020 i think it's going to be a very important year for ethiopia politically it's going to be an important year for me personally so i think it's going to be exciting thank you so much greta thank um, you so finally then um what one achievement are you most proud of 
I would say that definitely when looking back at this year, I'd, I'm really, really proud of bringing Eritrea on board to the EPI and making them a member state in a conservation, an international conservation initiative, for sure. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. What an achievement. Um, and if there's, is there anywhere that people can go to uh, find out more about you, more about your work? Definitely the best place to find out about my work will be on the EPI Elephant Protection Initiative mm-hmm. website and WCS, Wildlife Conservation Society. But personally about me, you can find me at, at the Italiopian on Twitter and Instagram. Great. And we will try and put those in the show notes afterwards so people can find you as well. Yes. Thank you so much, Greta. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to the Born Free podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to our YouTube channel to watch the episodes, follow us on social media or head to our website, bornfree.org.uk. My name's Sarah Locke and our producer is Philip Fortuna. See you next time.